You cannot escape this principle. You can try to rationalize it away. It is going to come through anyway. You just can't kill it. You can't suppress it. It is going to show its ugly face again and again and again, as long as there's nature, as long as there's the universe, as long as there's human beings who can witness these effects consciously. All right, welcome everybody to this new video. This is the second part of my Seabold series, WG Seabold WG Seabold. Today's topic is the abyss. Now Seabold takes us into the abyss with him. And there's no better way to start this video off than showing you this image first. So this is a diamond mine in South Africa. And we can see these ropes and they are kind of, they span over this abyss, over this valley, like where the diamonds are being dug out of the ground. And Zebad makes this kind of like a metaphor for nature and civilization themselves. And this is like a recurring theme in his books. It looks like a spider's web. The spider's web, of course, connects everything to everything, basically. So these ropes over the abyss, they are kind of like a spider's web and because things can be moved through these ropes, via these ropes, and um, everything is kind of connected. And it's, of course, it's also like a symbol of civilization exploiting the resources of nature. But then, I mean, of course, these natural resources, they also lead to very negative outcomes because people commit acts of violence because they want these natural resources. And so, I mean, this destructive principle, again, is basically already there in nature. And it just brings out the same principle in human beings who are inevitably a part of nature themselves. Sibait connects this spider's web image, these ropes over the abyss, to the railroad and the railway system in Europe, especially during the Second World War and the way it was used to move millions of people to the concentration camps. So it's just a symbol of the Holocaust itself and of Holocaust logistics. There's the spider's web and of course the center. That's where the spider usually lives, but the spider keeps on building its web. And uh, whatever gets in there, gets stuck and doesn't get out anymore. And Sebald used this spider also as a symbol. It's like the spider that kind of connects all these concentration camps in Europe. And this spider, of course, is the swastika, which is in the middle of the web that it has built for itself. And this is also one thing, this abyss that everything finally ends up falling into is also a sign of modern times and he sees three basic principles at work that are the origin of modern misery. And these principles are science, time and capitalism. And Sebald writes, Und wie schrecklich uns jedes Mal, trotzdem wir es doch erwarten, das Vorrücken dieses einem Richtschwert gleichenden Zeigers schien, wenn er das nächste 60. einer Stunde von der Zukunft abtrennte. Und mit einem derart bedrohlichen Nachzittern, dass einem beinahe das Herz aussetzte dabei. So he's observing a clock and it's in, in the station of, I think it must be Brussels in Belgium. And this is what it means. And how terrible the advance of this hand, like a sword of justice, seemed to us every time, although we expected it, when it separated the next 60th of an hour from the future. And with such a threatening after tremor that one's heart almost stopped. So time itself is an executioner's sword. And you just do not get away from it. No, you will be executed by it eventually. So this is also a principle of nature at work here. There's no way dodging this sword. In the end, it's going to end your life. So time itself to him is one of the, um, well, let's say standardized time, standardized modern time is one of the key principles that led to many of the horrors of the 20th century. 
and Seebald goes to Greenwich to an observatory. And of course, Greenwich time, that's like the standard time we use in this world. And he writes. Wenn Newton gemeint hat, sagte Austerlitz und deutete durch das Fenster hinaus auf den im letzten Widerschein des Tages gleißenden Wasserbogen, der die sogenannte Insel der Hunde umfängt, wenn Newton wirklich gemeint hat, die Zeit sei ein Strom wie die Themse. Wo ist dann der Ursprung der Zeit und in welches Meer mündet sie endlich ein? Jeder Strom ist, wie wir wissen, notwendig zu beiden Seiten begrenzt. Was aber wären so gesehen die Ufer der Zeit? If Newton meant, said Austerlitz, pointing out the window to the arch of water gleaming in the last reflection of the day that surrounds the so-called Isle of Dogs, if Newton really meant that time is a river, like the Thames, then where is the origin of time? into which sea does it finally flow? Every river, as we know, is necessarily bound on both sides. But what would be the banks of time seen in this way? So time is a strange phenomenon that cannot be explained by traditional physics. The thing is that time has become standardized just to do business. And of course, the epicenter of time is Greenwich in England, and this is basically well, the time of the British Empire. So it's a global empire that has conquered the whole world. So it's impossible to not be influenced by this standard time created by modern trade, capitalism, enlightenment, and business. It's everywhere. So Newton in this paragraph represents the authoritarian word of science. It's the authority that controls this modern world. So because we remember the modern world is based on what well, industrial revolution and it's the enlightenment and then it's science. And they all go hand in hand because it's like uh, the advent of uh, rationality. So it's the rational mind that standardizes this world. And to this day, the problem is rationality doesn't mean that we can just evade brutality. No. So it's still there. This destructive principle of nature is still there, no matter how rational you are about things. So this is something like science and the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution and Capitalism have not been able to eradicate. No. It's the opposite. It has brought more violence on a much larger scale into this world. So in a way, this project of rationality and, well, I mean, okay, in terms of like uh, the Kantian like perpetual peace project, it has failed completely. But this is Sebald's view. There's other views, like let's say Steven Pinker, who thinks like uh, this world has become less violent. So it's much better than it used to be before. And there might be a valid point to that. But for Sebald, he sees the principle of destruction at work everywhere. So Sebald is very much against this uh, scientific absolutism because he connects it with the enlightenment and the rise of bourgeois society capitalism he highly doubts that these forces bring good because they probably lead to greed and the exploitation of course the earth gets destroyed but still nature itself is also a destructive principle so it's like this vicious circle that human beings are caught in or the whole world is caught in so it is not possible to break out of this vicious cycle or to break this cycle at all It's just an eternal, vicious circle. And in this context, Greenwich takes the place of the localized time of capitalism. It's the center of capitalism and the modern world. And let's say the colonization of the world with these modern principles of industry, science, enlightenment, and capitalism. That's where it came from. This is the center of the modern world. And Sebald, in this case, he's heavily influenced by the Frankfurt School, of course. And he just doubts that the Enlightenment itself is a benevolent project. It's this dialectic of the Enlightenment. And um, he just says it might be a good project. I mean, the idea was good. Well, like the idea of communism might have been, in its principle, good. It just did not work out. So it just led to even more suffering and even larger catastrophes on a societal level and on a global level because the destruction has also brought the possibility to kill even more people with more advanced 
weaponry. So as good as the initial idea might have been, the problem is the way it was implemented was deeply flawed. And this is also something like when it comes to science, like uh, a French philosopher, Bruno Latour, he also says, well, science has already taken the place of a religion because you have to have faith in science now. So this is your new guide. Science tells you what to do. And then, well, you have to just listen to science. Mm, that's the problem. So Zebat also doubts that. He thinks like uh, this, let's say, sterile kind of like rationality does not lead to ideal outcomes. So we always have to question things, which is the basic principle of the Enlightenment, right? Use your brain. Look at things. Question them. If they don't make sense to you, well, then probably they just don't make sense. But you have the brain power to think for yourself. And you can make a decision, an informed decision, according to what you see. And if it's really not logical to you, well, then it's probably just not for you. Or it might just be wrong. So it's like the Popperian principle of falsification. Now let's see how it holds up. Can these ideas be falsified? Can a theory be falsified? And if it can't be falsified, well, then it's just not right. Don't try to verify it. Try to falsify it. So you go the other way. And if it doesn't hold up, well, then there's a flaw within theory. It falls apart. And this is what Zebad sees in modern science, in capitalism itself, and, of course, in the Enlightenment and the situation as led to itself as well. So in a way, what Zibat sees is that the scientific progress and industrial progress has brought a fatal outcome all over the world because it kind of like has influenced the whole world and like the after effects can be seen everywhere. It doesn't matter if you go to England, if you go to the center of Europe or is it to Corsica, you go to China, you go to uh, the Congo, Africa. It doesn't matter. It's everywhere. So the traces of this failed, fatal project of progress can be seen in every part of the world. So it's like this rational scientific mentality that has not been able to bring peace and prosperity to all parts of the world. In many cases, it has brought the opposite effect. So it has been destructive. And again, the basic destructive principle of nature itself has manifested itself in the modern project of science and the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and capitalism. You cannot escape this principle. You can try to rationalize it away. It is going to come through anyway. So you just can't kill it. You can't suppress it. It is going to show its ugly face again and again and again, as long as there's nature, as long as there's the universe. And of course, as long as there's human beings who can witness these effects consciously. And I already mentioned like one of the basic, one of the most significant symbols and manifestations of these principles of destruction is the railway system because it connects everything to everything like a spider's web. It's everywhere in Sibad's work and ironically or like consequentially, it is also connecting all Sibad's writings to each other because it's just such a very important motif for Zibald. And it's also like the railway system and the advance in technology and weaponry and society itself, due to the progress of technology, it's still a manifestation of the destructive principle of capitalist and industrial expansion. So it permeates everything. It's everywhere. And a very good indication of that is the First World War. And this image is from that time. And it depicts the technology that is making the German war effort possible. It's a wood engraving depicting the contribution of science and technology to the German war effort. So it's science and technology working hand in hand to destroy other human beings. And to Zebad's mind, it really kicked off with the Industrial Revolution. And he writes this about Benjamin Disraeli's vision of the New Jerusalem in his book Nach der Natur, After Nature, begeistert von dem wahrhaftig grenzenlosen Wachstum der Industrie hat der Staatsmann Disraeli Manchester, die wundervollste Stadt der Neuzeit genannt, ein himmlisches Jerusalem, dessen Bedeutung allein die Philosophie zu ermessen vermöge. 
inspired by the truly limitless growth of industry, the statesman Disraeli called Manchester the most wonderful city of modern times, a heavenly Jerusalem whose significance only philosophy can measure. It's really interesting, like the project of building a new Jerusalem. How are you going to do it? Well, let's turn to technology. How about that? So technology will be able to turn this whole world in a new heavenly kingdom. Well, that's basically the Tower of Babel. That's the problem. It's hubris. And where are you going to build anyway? Where are you going to end up with? Is it a heavenly city? Or is it something much more sinister? Because remember, to see by its mind, what is constructive is ultimately also destructive. So you're trying to do good. You're trying to build something beautiful. But in the end, it might lead to the opposite outcome. And Zebad, he moved to Manchester to go to university in the 1960s. And he writes about this formerly heavenly Jerusalem, this city in the sky, this paradise, this man-made paradise based on technology. And he just describes what's left of its glory. Allmählich kam ich auf meinen sonntäglichen Exkursion über die Innenstadt hinaus in die unmittelbar angrenzenden Bezirke. Beispielsweise in das gleiche der Victoria Station, um das sternförmige Gefängnis Strangeways herum gelegene vormalige Judenviertel. Bis in die Zwischenkriegszeit hinein ein Zentrum der großen jüdischen Gemeinde von Manchester. War dieses Quartier von seinen in die Vororte übersiedelnden Bewohnern aufgegeben und seither von der Stadtverwaltung dem Erdboden gleichgemacht worden. Nur eine einzige leerstehende Häuserzeile, durch deren zerschlagene Fenster und Türen der Wind fuhr, fand ich noch vor als Zeichen, dass hier tatsächlich einmal jemand gewesen war. Das eben noch zu entziffernde Schild an Anwaltskanzlei mit den legendär mich anmutenden Namen Glickmann, Grunwald und Gottgetreu. On my Sunday excursions, I gradually came beyond the city center into the immediately adjacent districts, for example into the corner, the former Jewish quarter, located just behind Victoria Station around the star-shaped Strangeways prison. Until the interwar period, this quarter was the center of Manchester's large Jewish community, but had been abandoned by its residents who had moved to the suburbs and had since been razed to the ground by the city council. I only found a single row of empty houses, with the wind blowing through their smashed windows and doors, as a sign that someone had actually once lived here, the sign of a law firm that I could just make out with the names Glickmann, Grunwald and Gottgetreu, which seemed legendary to me. Glickmann, Grunwald, Gottgetreu, that's of course the family names of the former Jewish residents of that quarter. Everything is abandoned, things basically lie in ruins. So this is what is left of this formerly rich and abundant New Jerusalem that Benjamin Disraeli had this vision about. So this heavenly city, they tried to build it with their technology. But in the end, there's nothing left of its glory. It's become a decrepit wasteland, basically. And there's only traces of the life that had been there for years or like centuries even. So this is just this eternal cycle of nature. Nature creates and nature destroys. It gives life and it takes life. That's the way it goes. So this is the basic character of this world and the universe. And there's no way to get around it. So even the heavenly city will not be for eternity. That's a dark view that Sibad has, but... It is in every single one of his books. He was probably not the most cheerful person, but kind of like contemplating the negativity and the dire situation of human beings and the world, the state of the world in general all the time. So this image kind of shows like how the city is organized. It's like these rows of houses. You know, it's been basically planned like uh, on a desk and then just built like this 
and there's an eerie kind of uh, resemblance to the way Auschwitz was designed. You know, they had the barracks for the prisoners. And um, this is also like uh, one of the uh, manifestations of capitalism. So in a way, you want to build the heaven in Jerusalem, yeah. But I mean, what you build is like a giant extermination machine, like a horrible, horrible hell, a man-made hell. This is not the heavenly city. This is not the new Jerusalem that you want. No, it's a man-made hell that it devours every human being that gets into it. Again, you see like these factory buildings and there's the railway going through there. And of course, these extremely high chimneys and just has this eerie resemblance of Auschwitz and the Nazi concentration camps. So it really seems like these factories and the industrial landscape that was created by people in order to generate revenue and bring prosperity to the world with the goal of creating the new Jerusalem has also a very, very dark downside, which is you can create money, you can create wealth, but you can also destroy life itself on a scale never possible before the onset of the industrial revolution, capitalism and science and technology. So, Zibayat conjures up very, very dark images here, but he sees the connection between industry and genocide on an industrial scale. And in my next video, I'm going to talk about how Zibayat describes human civilization itself as a parasitic organism. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.